All right, thank you everyone for being willing to come second to last presentation on the last day. I know it's been a really long uh, past couple of days, um, but I'm glad you all took the time out to come to this one. So as you are aware, this is designing accessible games. We're gonna be talking about techniques for designing for color contrast, subtitles and remappable controls. And then we'll also take some time to talk about game difficulty and how different levels of difficulty based on your user needs and while still being true to your game's intent. My name is Steven Lambert. I'm a senior developer working on Axe Core. I, my free time though, I love creating games. My email is steven at sklambert.com. My Twitter handle is Stephen K. Lambert and my website is stephenklambert.com. So you can go find me afterwards uh, connect, love to hear from you. Also, if you'd like this, uh, not only are the slides downloadable in a PDF form, but if you want to come back to them, there's a Google Doc available at this bit.ly URL. So it's a bit.ly slash designing dash accessible dash games. So you can get to here anytime. Uh, so like I said, I'm a developer. I love developing in HTML5 and JavaScript are my primary tools. I, uh, as a side project, I've developed a couple of hobby games, things like uh, Breakout or Rampart I've done just clones of for fun. I uh, did Pac-Man recently and that was kind of fun too. Uh, currently, I'm working on my first commercial game so it's called Carrot Win. It's an accessible puzzle game based on Sokoban. And there's a free demo you can go play at caridwingame.com. That's K-E-R-I-D-W-E-N-G-A-M-E.com. So that's all about me. So let's get into what you actually came for, which is designing accessible games. So what does it mean to make a game accessible? Now this goes beyond just adding keyboard support or screen reader information, but what, what does it mean to the player to make a game accessible? So that means that for the player, we are allowing them to play your game in a way that works best for them. There are four common problems that stop most players from playing a game in a way that works best for them. Uh, these are taken from uh, something called the Game Accessibility Guidelines. Um, there's also a favorite topic, which is game difficulty and accessibility. And that appears uh, every time a very hard game like uh, Dark Souls comes up and then everyone talks about how difficulty settings could help, and then is that being true to what Dark Souls as a difficulty game should be? But we'll go over all of that at the end and talk about a lot of fun stuff there. So first, we're going to talk about controls. Remappable controls are one of the best value accessibilities. This comes a direct quote from Game Accessibility Guidelines. This is because remappable controls allow your players the ability to use whatever input device or setups that work best for their needs. Uh, players play with the puff, sip, puff sticks. Uh, players can play one-handed. Players can play with the Xbox accessibility controller and custom configurations with buttons and foot pedals or whatever else meets their needs. Remappable controls will ensure that they can play in a way that works best for them. So do that first. You should provide a way to remap all player actions. Uh, that lets players map actions to the most convenient posi position on whatever setup they have for them. So we have an example here is an image from uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, their controller remap settings, which allows every action the player can perform to be remapped to a different control. So things like walking or shooting or aiming can all be remapped. Going beyond just actions in the game, you, if you have any hotkeys in your game, which is very common for real-time strategy games, you should also provide a way to customize those hotkeys as well. So in this example, we have StarCraft II, and then we have a screen of all the different hotkeys that can be used for a Terran player. And it allows you to remap each of those hotkeys for the building actions or the unit actions uh, to fit your needs. Going even further beyond just common actions, the more granular your customization options, the better. So here we have a great example, which is Overwatch. In Overwatch, there are many different heroes, each which have their own play styles and abilities. The Overwatch control settings allow you to remap individual character actions and settings to better suit the play style and the needs of each character. 
Um, this also includes uh, in this image, uh, not only actions, but they also have things like reticle, uh, reticle. They can change what it looks like, maybe what color it is for each individual character. It's also important not to forget to change any in-game prompts when you change controller uh, configuration. So here we have an image of Batman Arkham Asylum and the Batman is holding on to a villain and there's a letter A prompt showing him what he can do. Um, a game that didn't do this quite so well was Lego Ninjago. Uh, I was playing co-op with one of my children and we noticed that when you switch to co-op and you played single controller uh, tilted sideways, none of the tutorial prompts showed your controller to change position, but instead it was still vertical. Um, so we had to figure out when it wanted the right button that it was actually the bottom button because our controller was different. Now players can often switch between multiple inputs during a game. So common between switching between keyboard or controller or gamepad. Uh, you can even use both at the same time for some controller setup. So you should allow all actions to be remapped between keyboard and controller as well as mouse uh, inputs as well. In the game No Man's Sky, pictured here in their controller settings, they have a column for keyboard and mouse inputs, as well as a separate column for gamepad inputs for all their actions. Part of control settings is also to help with the sensitivity of those controls. So you should allow users to adjust sensitivity of mouse movement or controller configurations. Uh, this includes not only mouse movement, but things like camera movement for dual stick controllers, um, as well as controller rumble settings and juice effects. And if you're unfamiliar with the term juice effects, what that means are th uh, things that we add to a game for its feel. So things like screen shake or camera bloom, uh, those things should also have their own settings to help the user. Lastly, you should provide options to simplify a control scheme. So for games that use complex controls, if you can simplify it to maybe just a few buttons, uh, that helps a lot of players. Uh, you should also allow to change between things like press and hold to toggle or skipping quick time events with just a single button press. And this also should include ways for a user to play with just a single one-handed controller um, rather than having two dual stick controller setups. You can just map things to one half of it. Um, a great example of this was the new Spider-Man game, game that came out. They had tons of accessibility features that were praised for being able to skip their quick time events with a single button and so forth. Um, but this simpler control schemes and being able to skip these events also can benefit users who experience fatigue or repetitive strain injury or other types of disabilities that need these settings in order to play for your game comfortably. So to recap, uh, we want to allow players to remap their controls and don't forget any in-game prompts. We want to allow players to change the sensitivity for cameras, controllers, or even the juice effects. And we want to allow for simpler control schemes or skipping for real-time events and toggle to press. Next, we want to talk about interface accessibility. So the first and most important key to interface accessibility is don't make your text so small that you can only read it when it's a computer screen less than a foot away. Uh, the new God of War had a pretty big problem with this when it first came out. Their text was pretty small throughout the entire game and all their menus. And it was really hard for a lot of players to be able to read it, especially when they were sitting on, on their couch uh, 10 feet away from their TV. So they eventually came out with a patch to try to fix the problem, uh, to try to improve it, but it only helped a little bit. So Amazon TV actually has a good recommendation that they use for captioning that we can apply to uh, text just in a game, which is, about 28 pixels font minimum for viewing about 10 feet away and 1080p. Uh, you should increase the spacing between sentences as well so that your text is easier to read. That line width is also important. In conjunction with a legible font size, you should also have an easy to read font that is sans serif mixed case. Small, all caps, cursive or italicized text can be hard to read with someone who has dyslexia. But that's not to say that you always have to have an easy to read font. If you allow your users to customize the font, that lets them decide what's legible to them. So you can keep a personality in your game with a nice unique font, but then provide an option to replace that font with a much simpler one if the user so desires. 
Another way to help users is to add options to increase the font size or the interface or the HUD or whatever you want to call it. This includes things like font size, in-game prompts, uh, images used for uh, the game. In Borderlands 2, they had a setting where you could increase the HUD scale, uh, which also meant that the font size through all the game and the captions and everything you could interact with increased as well. Uh, you can also add options to customize the UI style, which means things like opacity, color. Um, you can also go even further and customize the position of those UI elements. So those customizing UI position is common in games such as MMORPGs, where you have lots of information on the screen and you want to let users put it where they want. Uh, in this example, we have an image of Pit Boy, which is the HUD in uh, Fallout 4, and they have settings for their HUD color, the RGB scale you want to use, and the Pip-Boy color RGB scale as well as HUD opacity. So to recap, you want to use large, easy to read font in your game, and you want to design that from the beginning because it's always harder to implement larger font if you didn't take it to account later and as uh, uh, God of War series found out. You want to provide options to customize the font size and its style for users. And you want to be able to provide options to customize the UI, including its position, its size, its style, or its opacity. Next, we have color. Uh, so let's first talk about color deficiency. Uh, if you are unaware, deutronopia, which is a red-green color deficiency, is the most common form and affects about 5% of the world population. What that means is there's a high probability that someone in this call watching this video has a form of color deficiency. Um, the key takeaways that are colors tend to look similar if you have a color deficiency. So reds and greens and oranges could look yellowish or pinkish sometimes, uh, and rarely green could look bluish. Um, but the most important thing is that all meaning of color is lost when you have a color deficiency. So we have this example of a match three game where you have to match three squares to, of a similar color in order to clear the board. With, uh, in the bottom right corner, it's full color, no color deficiency shown, and you can make out the different colors like red, green, blue, yellow, purple. Uh, but in the top left corner is shown the same image, but with a deuteronopia applied to it. And it's very difficult to see what colors are what, because all the blues and the greens look the same, and there's a bunch of different shades of yellows. Um, so good luck being able to try to match three colors if all you can see are two out of the five that are shown. So the important takeaway is don't use color alone to convey meaning. So all meaning is lost if you can't perceive the color. So how do we make that work for games? Well, first we can add a non-color identifier, such as an icon or a pattern to distinguish between the colors. So here we have a couple of images. Uh, we first have the game Hue, which if you're unfamiliar with the game, it uses a color wheel to change the color of the game itself. And that will then reveal different uh, things. So either a door blocks your way and you can change the color to make the background the same color as the door, and then the door vanishes and you can walk right through. So to help with color deficiency, they added symbols to each of the colors and to all the objects in the game that use that color. So then instead of having to color match, all you had to do was symbol match. Uh, in another example, uh, we have the game Faster Than Light. And Faster Than Light, when your ship is damaged in certain areas or if there's not enough oxygen in an area, the game that area tends to go from light red shade to darker red shade. Um, and enemy's health, uh, people can board your ship and you have your crew's health or your enemy's health. The crew's health was green and the enemy's health was red. When they, they enabled color deficiencies by having the areas, instead of being a shade of red to a darker red, they had uh, patterns. They had um, alternating colors of red stripes to help indicate the level it was. So they applied a pattern to it. And then they changed the enemy health to blue to help distinguish between a red-green color deficiency. 
It's also important to make sure that not only do you have good colors, but that your colors contrast well against their backgrounds. And this includes text colors. So the common recommendation for WCAG is 4.5 to 1. In a game called Monsters Ate My Birthday Cake, which is a little puzzle game, they had a world which is very dark tile set. It was supposed to be like lava volcano looking. And part of their game objects were spikes that popped out of the ground. When the spikes were up, they're dark black. The background behind it was kind of a light gray. You could kind of make them out. But the harder part was when the spikes were down. And uh, there's this red square in the top right corner and you can barely make it out, but there are some spikes up there that are sitting in the ground. So if you weren't aware of that because you couldn't see it, uh, that could cause you problems in trying to solve the puzzle. Uh, so this is, is very important that you keep in mind that your objects have to contrast against the background of your game. So something you can do is provide an option to change the contrast. And then this screenshot is a game of Epic Eric. You can add a black layer between the background and the foreground elements, and you can adjust how the opacity of that layer. You can also make it completely white. Uh, so that could allow your users to determine what looks best to them in the background uh, to help contrast with the foreground objects. Another example is to just remove the background completely and make it black. Um, in Street Fighter 4, they were they had the option where you could just disable the background and it just, instead of showing a very colorful background of whatever world uh, area arena you were fighting in, it just became a black box. Uh, so help make sure, remove the distractions from the background and make sure that the foreground players uh, contrasted well. Another option you can do is to add outlines to foreground objects. So here we have an example of Eagle Island, which um, shows an image of the player who has uh, wings on his back flying in the air. He's shooting out an eagle against some bat looking enemies in a cave. And the player, the eagle he throws and the bats all have a thick white outline around them to help them contrast against the blacker background of the cave. Lastly, if you, if you want, you can also just allow full customization of colors in your game. So this is more common in games that have uh, distinct colors for teammates or enemies or different objectives on the map. Um, you can allow your player to customize what those colors are for them. Uh, in Battlefield 1, their option settings for uh, their markers allowed full RGB color scales for their things like their squad color, their team color, their enemy color, and neutral player color. So to recap, for colors, you can first don't use color alone to convey the meaning. And to instead, you should use icons or patterns to distinguish between colors and meaning of those colors for your players. You should also provide an option to increase the contrast between the background and the foreground color. And you should provide options to customize the colors if that makes sense for your game. Next, we want to talk about subtitles. So subtitles are very interesting. Um, there's a good chance that more players play, play with subtitles on than you may think. So in Assassin's Creed Origins, over 60% of the players played with subtitles on. Now, this is important because in Origins, subtitles were turned off by default. So that means 60% of the players went to their settings to turn captions on. Because of this, uh, in the next game, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, they left subtitles on by default. And 95% of the players left them as on. So only 5% of players turned them off. And then they did the same for five, Far Cry New Dawn, and 97% of the players left them on. So a huge percent of the players want subtitles on in their games. But as a game industry, we don't always do very well with subtitles. Uh, so first, start by following the same guidelines you do for text sizes and colors that we've already talked about. Large, easy to read font, good contrast between the background and the text. Otherwise, you end up with something like this. So uh, this game, I'm not, it's, it's called Dwarvener Forge, um, I believe. I can't remember exactly the name of the game, but it shows uh, a menu screen and they're trying to interact with some object to create an item and very tiny text that I can barely make up what it says and I'm right in front of it. 
um, is whatever the caption of the person is saying. Uh, so it's impossible to read whatever that subtitle is. Or you can end up with problems of contrast. So in this game, there is a, a room, a main lobby of like a hotel. And there's somebody is saying something about the staff and the subtitles are white and they don't have any black background behind them. And the player is standing in front of glass windows and a glass door. And it makes the white text completely disappear against the white windows from the outside light. Uh, so that, those are very common problems we can encounter with our subtitles. So instead, we want to do better. So the best approach is to add a dark, transparent background behind the subtitles. Uh, the other option is you can add a outline to the white text, like a black outline. Um, but it's more common and usually a better approach just to just add a black background. Because some players can't read the subtitles, even with the outline, and they need a black background behind them. So in this game is the game Prey. Uh, it's showing a scene where a player is speaking behind some glass, uh, and the subtitles uh, have a black background behind them while the player is speaking. But not only should you add the, back, the black background, but you should also add a setting to change the opacity of that background. So let players decide whether they want it or don't, or how, how dark it is. Also, it is very important that we don't overwhelm the screen with a bunch of text. So in this image of XCOM 2, it's one of the cutscenes where the leader of the XCOM council is talking to your commander, and it is just a paragraph of text that takes up like the bottom third of the whole screen. Um, this is not only makes it really hard to read, but it's really easy to lose your place while that scrolling text is going by and you're trying to just read across the whole line. So instead, use only two lines per subtitle. That's about a max of 40 characters per line. The game Hitman did this really well. Um, and this image is just one of the Hitman levels and the person talking about Hitman's goal and his objective, just two lines of subtitles 40 characters per line, and then the next time they talk, they'll update the subtitles. Also, uh, when a player is talking or a character in the game is talking, you should show the character's name. As they continue speaking, you can drop the name for future blocks of subtitles. It's assumed that they are continuing to talk. But as soon as a new character starts talking, you'll have to show that, player's, that character's name again. Uh, so that lets the person know that a new person is now talking in the subtitles. Uh, again, uh, a game that shows this, I can't remember which, oh, um, Dead to Rights, that's what it was. So this game is Dead to Rights, uh, and it shows someone, a police officer talking, and his name is Redwater, and in the caption it says Redwater colon, and then it goes and continues on with what he's saying to the player. Now, subtitles cover more than just spoken words and characters' words it also should cover audio cues in the game. So games provide a lot of information through audio cues, things like enemies yelling that they threw a grenade or a player activating a special ability in a multiplayer game, uh, maybe footsteps of someone approaching or gunshots happening over across a certain direction. These auditory cues should also be conveyed and subtitled so that players can receive that same audio information that others receive. Uh, the game Half-Life 2 in this image did that really well. Uh, then in this image, they are shooting a bunch of things in a warehouse or a garage, it looks like. And the captions not only uh, show the person being talked to, but it also shows things like uh, shattering glass and partial pistol shot, or they can't use sound so that someone knows that the thing they're trying to interact with isn't usable. That information should also be conveyed to a player. Going further, we can also add direction to our audio sources. So for example, here we have Minecraft, and when you have the captions turned on, as you are walking across uh, the ground, or if you're swimming in the water, or something else is swimming in the water, they'll have a caption swimming, and then they have an arrow pointing whether it's to the left or to your right, to let you know which direction that noise came from. Uh, even, even more uh, amazing is the game Fortnite, which, takes a 360 circle around the player and then shows the sound direction that it came from in that 360 degree radius. So you know exactly about where it came from. And they go further showing an icon and a color 
of what that sound was, whether it was gunfire or footsteps or things of that nature to help make sure that if you don't have the sound on for whatever reason, or if you just can't hear it, you get the same information that audio cues provide. And of course, when in doubt, TV standards have been doing captioning and subtitles for years, and they have lots of standards. You can go to the BBC's github.io page. They have something on subtitle guidelines. Uh, Netflix also has their own guidelines that you can go to uh, to read more about how TV handles best practices to subtitles. So to recap, you want to use large, easy to read text, which contrasts well against the background. You want to keep your subtitles to a few lines of short text each. You want to show the speaker's name, and you want to caption the audio cues in your game. So last, we're going to talk about game difficulty. Now, game difficulty can be a controversial topic. Some players like difficulty and don't think a game should be less difficult. Um, other players want to play difficult games but are unable to because it's too difficult. Uh, so a common argument you'll hear for a game is that they shouldn't include a difficulty option because it keeps to the creator's intended way to play. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about any of that, so we're going to try not to be controversial here. So instead, what we're going to focusing on is what difficulty in a game means and why it's important to a player to have it. So first, I'm going to misquote uh, Kaita Takahashi, who is the creator of Katamari Damacy, who said that games can be as difficult as they like, so long as they are fun. So what exactly do we mean by game difficulty and being fun? So when we talk about game difficulty, what we're actually talking about is a single access of a graph, of a player's experience with the game. So we have on one axis is the difficulty of that game, and on the other axis is the skill or ability of that player. So when compared to the player's skill and ability, if the game is too challenging for the player, then they will experience frustration. And they'll have a greater chance of just stopping or abandoning the game because it's just too frustrated. But if the player skill or ability is far greater than the difficulty of the challenge of the game, then they will experience boredom. And they also have a chance to just stop playing the game because it's not enjoying or difficult for them. So what we have then is this very narrow channel uh, in the middle between difficulty and the scalability that we call the flow zone. Uh, so the flow zone is where the player is neither overly frustrated nor are they overly bored. And so uh, what we want then is the player to kind of remain in this flow zone. So where the game presents a difficulty, um, that's just above the player's skill level, but not too much that they get frustrated. And then as the player's skill and ability adjusts for that difficulty and they learn to meet that challenge, then they get a new difficulty that kind of keeps them in this ebb and flow of the flow zone. So the flow zone is not just a straight line. It's more of a curve up and down between things that's difficult, their skill and their difficulty again. So when we talk about game difficulty, what we really want to be talking about is the relative challenge to the player's current skill level. So here's the question. What happens when a player cannot overcome a challenge? Uh, the reason for the challenge and the reason they can't come up, overcome it doesn't matter. It could be due to a physical or a mental disability, or it could even be for the player reaching the top of what their skill level is and no amount of additional play or practice will ever get them beyond that ability. So right, the, if it's too difficult, they become frustrated and they abandon your game. So the goal of any game should be to keep that player in that flow zone, uh, uh, present them challenges that they can overcome no matter what their skill level is. So then how do we do that? How do we keep varying players of varying abilities and skills in that flow zone and to avoid challenges that they themselves cannot overcome? So one thing you can do is you can have some form of difficulty option in your game. So these are different settings uh, that say easy, medium, hard, or some other thing that will cater to the skill uh, level that they'll, those players need. Um, so on this, we have an example of the old game Doom. Uh, they have an option screen for skill level. 
uh, from the top down from easy to harder, it says I'm too young to die. Hey, not too rough. Hurt me plenty, ultra violence and nightmare. Also, don't make fun or belittle your players through your difficulty options. This doesn't help, it's not funny. It only will make the players upset who need to choose those options to, for them to enjoy the game. You also want to give the players the right expectations for those different difficulty settings. So don't just list out the difficulties because the player won't always know what that means. You know, what does hurt me plenty mean in terms of the difficulty the game will provide? Uh, I don't know. I just have to assume that because it's at the top of the list and the bottom one says nightmare, nightmare sounds rough. So top must be a little easier. Um, so instead, what you should do is describe what each difficulty option can change in the game, whether that be enemies get more health, enemies do more damage or less damage or things of that nature. Uh, in this example, we have an image of the game Subnautica. When you start a new game, it has uh, four different options for difficulty, we'll say. Uh, so the first is survival, and it shows you that you'll have hunger and thirst, and you'll have player health, and you'll have to worry about your oxygen. Uh, but you can also have a game called Freedom, and that removes the health, and it, re or it removes the, the food and the water need, and it keeps you with just uh, health and oxygen. And then you have another one called Hardcore, which adds all four, but also I think adds permadeath. Um, and there's also creative, which has none of those options. You don't have to worry about any of those things. So it's very obvious in the game Subnautica what each of those settings will change in the game to help you as a player decide what it is you want your play style to be. Of course, you don't have to think of difficulty in terms of different settings like easy, normal, hard. You can also just have a group of settings. So in the game Celeste, they had what was known as the assist mode, which is just a group of four settings, which can change things like the play, the game speed, if you have inf infinite stamina, how many air dashes you have, and whether you have invincibility or not. Um, now these, these were amazing because these four options alone for Celeste, which is a very difficult platformer game, would allow lots of different people who couldn't play the game to do so. So I'm gonna play a video of it for a minute and what we're going to do is we're going to watch someone use voice control to play Celeste. So they're not using a keyboard, not using a controller, just voice control. And because they had these options, they were able to play the game. Celeste chapter one, voice controlled with invincibility, unlimited stamina, and 50% game speed, played quite a bit more quickly than last time. Yes. Right line jump. Ground. Jump six. Oh. Right long jump. 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 Up. Oh. Right. Dash. Dash up. Jump to. Right. Dash up. Okay, so in that video, we saw the player going through the beginning levels of Celeste, which have them do a bunch of different jumps and long jumps and dashes. There's spikes on the ground that they need to avoid and different obstacles. And because the player was able to turn on invincibility, because they could have infinite stamina, they were able to use voice controls to get through the game. Now, they weren't perfect. They hit a lot of spikes. Uh, they're, because they had infinite stamina, they could climb further or longer than they should. But for this player, who couldn't play the game as it was written with the normal controls, quote unquote normal, um, the default settings for those controls. This allowed them to play Celeste. And it was hard for them. I think they said this was um, their first time they were able to get in under five minutes. They were trying to play Celeste as fast as they could in that level. Uh, and it took lots of tries. I think it was like 20 to 30 tries uh, with these settings to do that. So. Game difficulty settings allow players with all sorts of abilities to enjoy the game at a level that works for them. And you can also not only just have individual settings, but you can customize different aspects of the difficulty and create their own experience through configurable settings. Uh, giving the player more knobs to fine tune, meaning they can better create an experience that's tailored for them. 
So in this example is a game called The Way of the Passive Fist. And in their difficulty settings, they have individual controls for how the enemy strength, uh, how many encounters you'll have, how many co the combo mastery you need to get, and how resourcefulness, excuse me, uh, how many resources I think it was uh, that you can encounter. So each of those can allow then the player to choose the difficulty for them. Um, of course, difficulty settings don't have to be sliders or switches. You can think outside of the box. So in this example, in Super Giant Game, um, in Bastion, their difficulty settings were actually the totems, the items, the idols, or the limiters in their other games that you could enable at any time. These unlockables increase the difficulty of the game in a single aspect, making enemies harder, making them have more health. And then you can mix and match those different difficulties to create the experience that you had most fun with. Uh, of course, doing that also then rewarded extra experience points for the user, so it kind of gave an incentive to try things that were harder to increase that difficulty. So here are just kind of a short list, non-comprehensive of different examples of difficulty settings. So you could have a practice mode, or um, which allows players to go to something maybe that was difficult uh, and then try it over and over. Um, think maybe about a roguelike things where you have to go many, many times in that first part of a roguelike uh, just to get to the later parts. But if you keep dying at the later parts, then all you have to do is do the beginning parts over and over and over again. So your skill, you can master those beginning parts really well and you'll quickly become bored of them. When it's really the end part that you need help with, you just die at this one boss, but getting to them is 20 minutes of things you've mastered. It, it can be really boring. But if you had a practice mode which says, oh, let me just go there, practice that boss, let me gain experience that way, that could help someone. Uh, you could also have an exploration or story mode, which removes all difficulty settings and it's just for them to have fun and explore the world. Great for things like dialogue heavy games where the action isn't what the main focus is, but it's more of the story progression. Things like manual save points allow players to save right before tricky things. Uh, and be able to reset right to that point without having to go through all that other stuff that they already did. Uh, world skips uh, act as kind of like a sort of world save, but they allow players to skip to different parts quickly if they've already gotten and done the beginning. Uh, there's also, you can adjust the game speed, so make the game faster or slower to help give people more reaction time to what they're doing. Uh, we saw that in that Celeste video by turning down the game time that gives the player more time to command uh, the game to say their inputs. Uh, invincibility acts as a kind of practice mode that lets players have fun without worrying about death. Uh, you can also increase players' stats, giving them more health, um, more endurance, more stamina, or you can do the same for the enemies. You can give them less health or less attack frequency. Uh, basically, any of these hard-coded magic numbers that your game has that determine what happens, you could just make a difficulty setting. So what's great about difficulty settings is that players will naturally play at a difficulty above their skill level. And that's because that's where the fun is. The players don't want to be bored. Players don't want to experience frustration. So they will find what works best for them to experience the game in a way that is fun. So to recap, there's a lot of information. So provide difficulty options for your players. So allow players to fine tune their experience uh, you can th through different difficulty settings, or you can have more settings that expose different knobs and magic numbers in your game that they can fine tune. And of course, think outside the box. You don't have to do sliders. You don't have to do different settings. You can have things like super giant games, which are uh, unlockables that make it more difficult, um, but the player can turn those on at any time. So if you want more information about uh, accessibility in games, you can go to game accessibility guidelines, all one word, .com. You can also go to accessible.games uh, slash accessible dash player dash experiences. Uh, there's also a really great YouTuber called Game Makers Toolkit, who if you haven't heard of him, he does fantastic uh, game design videos, uh, taking current games and past games. Uh, he did an entire series on accessibility in games that you can further get more information from. All right, so let's put that all into practice and let's try making a game accessible with just a couple of minutes I think we have left. So here is Arkanoid. 
Yeah, if you're not familiar with Arkanoid, it is kind of like breakout. So you have a little paddle at the bottom of the screen. You have a ball that you try to bounce off the paddle to hit different bricks uh, around the little screen. Uh, in Arkanoid, the bricks uh, have different colors. The colors represent the uh, points that you'll get for knocking them down. And sometimes those bricks can't be knocked down. Uh, the color, like the gray ones, you can't use the ball. They'll bounce right off, but they won't break. So what, everything that we've learned, what are some things maybe we could do to make the game more accessible? Uh, so first, we could, you know, applying the color contrast to make sure, well, maybe that light blue brick color, it doesn't contrast really well against that dark blue background. Uh, so we could either change the color of the brick to make it contrast better. Maybe we could have an option for a darker overlay to make the blue stand out of the brick better. Um, because the bricks have different colors that represent different points or whether you can or can't break them, we should also make sure those colors aren't their only way of conveying those meanings. So maybe we add icons to each of the bricks or a color pattern that help distinct, let the player know which bricks they can break and which breaks, bricks they can't break. Um, if we were talking about controls, uh, maybe the game was uh, designed so you could use WASD, but we wanna make sure we can allow the player to remap those controls to something else that works best for them, um, things of that nature. Uh, we can also, uh, Make sure that they have some enemies on the top of the screen. That's kind of hard to see as well. They're multi-shaped circular blobs. Um, maybe they don't stand out so well. So maybe we add a white outline to those enemies to help them contrast as well. So there's lots of different things. I mean, this is a very old game. Arkanoid came out a long time ago. Uh, but there's lots of things we can do to help improve it. So let's try a more modern game. So let's try. Breath of the Wild, uh, the late, uh, almost latest Zelda game, open world. So here uh, they have a puzzle where you have to make, if you're familiar with the old marble game Labyrinth, basically you have to take a ball through a maze and you have knobs that will make the maze tilt in one direction or another. Uh, and so Zelda did this. So we're just gonna watch a, a quick video. So just kind of get you uh, familiar with, with what they did. Uh, so they had the player uh, examine the puzzle, and then they have controls which are tilting the entire game itself. So the, the switch uh, pad, you will tilt that, and that tilt motion is then reflected in the labyrinth puzzle, moving the uh, marble, the blocks, the circular orb that you're trying to get to the end goal through the game. And there's lots of little holes or there's no walls on some of the edges that you could fall through. Um, so what could we do for this game to make it more accessible? Well, uh, for one, because the game relies on the input method of tilting the actual gamepad to move the labyrinth, uh, that we can make that better. We can say, if that doesn't work for you, let's remap those controls to maybe just the arrow keys or your controller D-pad or your controller thumbstick or whatever. Make sure that if the player isn't able to tilt, that means they can still play the puzzle. Um, other things we can do is maybe the walls of the labyrinth aren't exactly the most apparent of where they are versus where walls aren't. And because that's part, a major part of the puzzle is understanding where those walls are so you don't fall off. We can make sure that they have good contrast against the background. Uh, we can make sure we, the player understands where those walls are. Now, maybe we can help them again, add an outline to the walls so that players understand where the boundaries are compared to the game and the floor and the outside. Um, if the, they did a pretty good job, their ball has a really bright orange color so you can see it against that background. Um, so yeah, there's, there's always something. If we look at a game, I'm sure there's something you, we could do. Uh, we, maybe their uh, font size for their control captions is pretty small. Uh, we could have an option to make sure that that's increased. So and there's always things we can do. So if we look at a game from a design point of view and we keep all what we learned in this session in mind, there are always ways that we can try to improve the accessibility for someone to help them play a game that works best for them. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna end five minutes early. Uh, so if you have any questions, 
Uh, please post them in the Q&A chat. I'll, I'd love to take them to answer what I can. Uh, and again, if you want to connect with me, here's that last slide. It's stephenklambert.com or at stephenklambert for my Twitter handle or stephen at sklambert.com is my email. Ah, oh, excellent. That was so good. There were so many questions in the chat. I'm just going to get right to them because we have tons. First question here from Anonymous. Do you have any tips about including these considerations at each step during development? What are some key areas that benefit the most from shifting left, uh, shifting left in planning and development? Yeah, so I mean, the easy answer is, well, everything is easier in the big it's easier to do and implement the sooner you do it. But I think the biggest one, the ones that will really mess with your game if you haven't thought about it is tech size. Um, if, if you didn't implement your text size to be bigger, then that can really mess up how you plan a layout. Uh, God of War ran into that. It, it was just crammed full of text and making it bigger was a problem. They, they couldn't make it too big because that would just throw off everything they had in their interface. Uh, so I think that one is probably the most important one to do as early as possible is make sure that when you have text, make sure it can be increased. I think they say 200% is the, the gold mark of text size increase. Very cool. So we had a few questions about screen reader use and uh, I'm just going to yeah. kind of generalize and, and merge these into one question, but uh, do you have any thoughts on using and testing and developing a game that can be used with screen readers or that a screen reader can uh, uh, digest, right? Yeah. So a, a screen reader will have to read the text of your game. You can't have the screen reader and read the visuals, but for a screen reader specifically, you want to make sure that your game's menus can be read by a screen reader. Um, the Xbox accessibility guidelines, they were recently updated, and they're a phenomenal resource, uh, have lots of examples of how to make sure that the information in your game's menu can be understand, understood by a screen reader. So for example, in an options menu, this is very similar to how the web uh, we want to convey information to a screen reader. You want your option menus to be such as example like lists, where it lists how many options there are on the screen at the moment. You want to make sure that the current value and label of that option are is read out, that updates to that option are announced. Um, you also want to make sure that if you have custom control prompts for a menu, uh, that those are also announced. So for example, some settings menus will have you hit like left bumper or right bumper in order to switch between different types of settings. Um, you want to make sure that the screen reader announces those settings that you can move with the left and the right bumper. Uh, and then as settings pages change or menus update, uh, like when you navigate between the menus, I mean that those new navigations uh, are read out. So a lot of this overlaps with how we want screen readers to read a web page. Um, so there's a lot of commonality there. Very cool. All right, here's another question for you. Um, uh, since you are actually developing a game, uh, do you have any tools or asset libraries that you can share with the audience that might help in developing an accessible game? Uh, I don't have any, for accessibility in specifically, I don't have any good tools. There's not been, um, it depends on what you're developing in. I develop in HTML5 and JavaScript. So a lot of my uh, accessibility, especially for screen readers, is uh, I just use HTML5 text, uh, HTML elements on the page hidden away uh, that mimic what my menus have on the game itself. If you're using Unity or if you're using uh, Godot or whatever other game frameworks, those frameworks may have their own tools. Um, you'll have to go investigate because I'm not familiar with all of them, but that's specifically for accessibility. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is this sounds like an opportunity for somebody out there, the community, to build some tools, right? Probably. Let's I, get on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I said, I only develop an HTML5 and JavaScript, so I'm not familiar with what all the other tools provide, but I know there's lots yeah. of things in those tools already or plugins or whatever. I'm, I'm with you on that. That's awesome. Um, so I think we are right at time, everyone. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single question here. Uh, there were so many great, 
uh, <laughs> questions. So yeah. reach out to Steven. He's, he's got his social uh, profiles linked there. Um, do reach out. We would love to hear from you. But thank you so much, Stephen. That was great. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for having me.